Well, as we've traversed some of the passages in relation to Stephen, we've tried to paint a little bit of a picture of the stellar character of Stephen and his brilliant mind. And we're going to drill down on that a little bit more this evening as we get into part of his speech. But just to update you, of course, we've, in our previous study, looked at the man. We've looked at the, the malice that the Sanhedrin had for him. We started a little bit in our last session on Abraham, so we're going to continue that tonight. And we're going to have a look at the maltreatment of Joseph, where Stephen draws a very interesting analogy between the lines of how uh, the Sanhedrin tr treated the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will remember that we have a format for the structure of the speech. It wasn't just sort of random thoughts put together. Uh, he was put on the spot, certainly, but there's a, an amazing format to his particular talk. And the charge is, of course, that Stephen was deprecating the temple and the holy place. And so he's going to now outline a little bit of history as to how the nation had really treated God. And it wasn't so much a focus on a holy place and a temple, but really the mind and the personality and the relationship that we should have with the Father is of uttermost importance. So a couple of things, three things I think that were unusual about his speech we've talked about. Number one, he doesn't reference Jesus Christ or the resurrection of Christ, which is pretty astounding because when you look at Peter's addresses, of course, the witness and the veracity of the resurrection of Christ was unanswerable. So Stephen, of course, could have brought out that whole aspect of the resurrection of Christ, but he doesn't touch on that at all, which is significant. Um, he doesn't bluntly address the inadequacies of the law of Moses, which he could have done as well. He could have said, well, the law is just a shadow and it's done away with and the fullness is in Christ. So he doesn't do that either. And he doesn't really focus on the destruction of the temple, which was to happen very shortly, AD 70, which the Lord Jesus Christ had talked about, which Daniel the prophets have talked about. He doesn't bluntly show that the temple is going to be destroyed. But he pulls out... Uh, very profoundly the examples of major characters from history, patriarchs, who, and here's the point, drew close to God without a temple and without Mosaic customs. And really, Paul, uh, really Stephen is outlining that. And so, of course, as we saw the structure previously, he's going to talk about Abraham. Uh, we'll see tonight they misunderstood the whole aspect of the, the life of Abraham and the promises they focused on this aspect of circumcision, which is a ritual that they thought connected themselves exclusively to God, but they missed the whole point of the promises. We'll have a look at Joseph as well. Again, no permanent temple, no mosaic customs. Joseph, of course, was hated by his brethren. We'll have a look in our next session about Moses. Again, they rejected Moses. There was no permanent temple, and his law that was introduced didn't save Israel. Their bodies were scattered throughout the wilderness. So salvation was not there under the law that Moses himself delivered. And then we'll have a look at our end section there in relation to Israel. Uh, as a nation, they disobeyed God's laws and really despised the tabernacle that he introduced. And then finally, David and Solomon himself, who said at the inauguration of the temple that God dwells in heaven and he can't be contained in a temple. So it's a very interesting progression through um, history. When we come to the speech of Stephen, there are some writers that actually criticise Stephen very harshly because they say he got all his facts wrong. Standing before the Sanhedrin, he's obviously nervous and he got a lot of facts wrong. We'll have a look at some of those tonight and see, well, Stephen didn't get any of his facts wrong. In fact, very amazingly, he had a succinct grasp of the intricacies of the Old Testament. Uh, Brother John Carter, in a little book called The Oracles of God, deals with actually 15 objections that some people have have made up where they feel Stephen was inaccurate. So we'll have a look at a couple of them tonight. Well, the first one, of course, is here in verse 4. Uh, there's a little comment there. It says that Abraham removed himself from Haran when his father was dead. Now, is Stephen wrong? Because this is the, uh, the big question here. And tonight, we're going to do a little bit of mathematics, which is wonderful because I was never good at maths at school. So it's great that, you know, as I've aged, I've got a better grasp of mathematics. Um, and Stephen is quite intricate with the numbers. You might have picked up a couple of times. There, there's a lot of numbers in this particular chapter. He's very definitive about uh, chronology and time periods. So we'll have a look at that. So we need to come back to Genesis chapter 12 um, because Stephen makes the claim that he left Haran when his father was dead. Well, we're going to do a little bit of maths here and see if Stephen's right. And it's pretty simple to do. 
Because we're coming back to Genesis chapter 12. Well, we can come back just to the context, Genesis 11 and verse 26. Uh, so, you know, you need to get out a piece of paper and draw some numbers on here. So here we go, 26. It says, Tira lived 70 years and he begat Abraham. Okay, so that's okay. That's not hard for us to understand, is it? Uh, verse 32 says, The days of Tira were uh, 205 years and he died in Haran, right? And Abraham, chapter 12, verse 4, was 75 when he left Haran. So, you know, if you're really good at maths, it's 70 plus 75, right? Because the record says T was 70 when Abram was born, and Abram was 75 when he left Haran, right? So he's 145, but his dad died when he was 205. Is that a big blue right at the beginning of Stephen's speech? You got all his maths mixed up and he wasn't quite right? Well, not at all. Because the answer is Abram was actually the youngest. So you see there in verse 26 where Abram's listed at the beginning and there are three sons, Abram, Nahor and Haran. While Abraham is listed at the front, it's because he's the more important. The scripture focuses on him for the next few chapters. It's not that he was the eldest at all. So Abram was actually the youngest. Terah begat Abram when he was actually 130 and he died at the age of 205, as we know, when Abraham was 75. Abraham is placed first because he was the most important. So it's just simply that Abraham is listed here in verse 26 as the first or the oldest, and he's not. Um, and there are other examples. I've just got other examples here. Shem, for example, in Genesis 5, verse 32, we always say Shem, Ham and Japheth. We put Shem at the front because he's the most important, but he's actually the youngest. And the proof is here in Genesis 12, verse 21, where it says, Japheth, the eldest. So there's a list that's out of order as well. And of course, this is an obvious one here, Moses. I sent the, before the Moses Aaron and Miriam in Micah. Well, we know Moses wasn't the oldest, don't we? Because Miriam was looking after him when he was born. And the age in Exodus 7, verse 7, gives Aaron as being older than Moses. So Moses is actually the youngest in that list. So against verse 32, you need to put compare Acts 7 verse 4 because you could read it as though, well, there's a bit of context there and chapter 12 verse 1 says that Abram left uh, Haran and went down and we don't really know uh, when he left. Obviously, we would say wrongly that... Um, t was 145 and he wasn't. So Stephen actually adds that detail, which we wouldn't know. So it means that Abram was in Haran for some time, five years. We often have this sort of imagination that, that Abram left Ur of the Chaldees, he went to Haran, God said, leave your family, and so he packed up and kept on going. But no, he was actually there for at least five years. And then his father died and then he left Haran. So Stephen is very accurate with his facts. He's got it right. And of course, people who are trying to drill holes into the Bible and find inconsistencies, they've got it wrong. And in fact, I think Brother Whitaker makes a, a very good comment. He says, commentators have aired their superiority, you know, their knowledge, their brilliance, by dwelling on the long catalogue of supposed biblical errors exhibited in Stephen's speech before the council. And then he says, does it never occur to these self-confident critics that if indeed Stephen's methods were so slapdash, his very able adversaries, both in the synagogue and the Sanhedrin, would have been eager and quick to expose them. Stephen wouldn't even got through this speech. They would have stood up and, st stood up and said, you've got your facts wrong. So no, Stephen is, is accurate and he is correct. And so he goes on uh, after outlining this uh, introductory fact about Abram when he left Haran, he, his father was dead. He goes on in verse 5 of Acts chapter 7, and verse 5 is a very, very important verse if you're ever teaching anyone first principles about the promises uh, and about or really um, trying to expose the falseness of the immortal soul. Verse 5 talks about the promises to Abraham, and it says that Abram had no inheritance, no, not so much to set a foot on. Okay, so Abraham never received the promises, but uh, as he goes on to say in verse 5 there, 
God gave him that promise that he should inherit it. So it's a very strong factor in relation to the rejection of the immortality of the soul. But there's a reason why Stephen is bringing that is because he has to remind the Sanhedrin of first principles. You know, the truth had deteriorated so much in Israel that the Sanhedrin believed in the immortal soul. And Stephen is starting at basic first principles. That's why he starts at Abraham. He's having to educate these people about what the promises to Abraham really meant. It's astounding, isn't it, to think the Jewish people could believe in the immortality of the soul after all that the Old Testament and the promises have pointed forward to. But here's Josephus, and he says, he's commenting about their beliefs. Their beliefs were that every soul is imperishable, but that only those that are righteous pass into another body, while those of wicked men are, on the contrary, punished with eternal tor torment. They hold the belief that an immortal strength belongs to the souls. So the people of Israel, the nation, had drifted so severely that Stephen had to correct the elders on basic first principles about the promises to Abraham. And he does that with a very large emphasis. And you'll notice that uh, in verse 5 again. Stephen just doesn't gloss over and say, well, the promises weren't fulfilled to Abraham. He really emphasises it. He says that God gave him none inheritance, no, not so much as to set his foot on. So there's almost that emphatic triple or quadruple denial that the promises were not, 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 not fulfilled. And he's laying a very, very important point because the promises to Abraham were superior to the temple itself. The whole of the nation revolved around the glory and the majesty of this temple and they thought it was the be-all and end-all of their worship of God. This was it, the temple. And Stephen comes and says, you don't even understand the promises. Abraham didn't receive him. The promises are far greater than this temple and their future. And so that's, well, when are they future? Luke 13, verse 28, 29, the Lord says, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob go into the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out, and they will come from the east and the west and the north and the south and sit down. It's going to be on the earth. He's not talking about heaven here. He's talking about the fulfilment of the promises in the future when Abraham would embrace and see the fulfilment of those promises. So, of course, Stephen's initial thrust is how important is the, is the temple, really. And again, the connection across to Hebrews chapter 11 is quite profound. He, Paul in Hebrews follows the same line, doesn't he? He talks about Abraham's faith. He went to a place. Was it a sacred place? Was there a temple there? Was there a law of Moses? Was there something unique and special? Well, he says, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise. It was a strange country. He dwelled in tents and he looked for a city who had foundations, whose builder and architect was God. And he didn't receive the promises. So he looked for a building, but it wasn't that temple there in Jerusalem. Because you know who built that temple? A Gentile, an Edomite. God wasn't the architect of that temple at all. It was an empty shell. He didn't even have the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place. Abraham looked beyond that to a greater fulfilment of that promise in the future. So Stephen's opening speech is sacred space is not important when it comes to a relationship with God and the future promises that would be fulfilled by Abraham. He never inherited any of it, so it was future. And so, of course, uh, Abraham's relationship with God was the important thing that Stephen is emphasising here. And even when we come back to one of the theme of Abraham's life, it is significant that the theme in Genesis was a tent and an altar. This is Abraham's life. He's a stranger and a pilgrim. We look at some of these references. It talks about a tent at an altar, a place of worship. So there was no great edifice or tabernacle or sacred space. Abram was wandering all over the land. He put down a tent, temporary, and he built an altar because he had a close relationship with God. So here it is. He built an altar and he pitched his tent and he built an altar. And again here, he went on his journeys from the south to Bethel under the place where his tent was. He put an, There was an altar there as well. Abram removed his tent and he built an altar. So you see, the whole focus of Abraham's life was a strong relationship with God. He took God with him wherever he went. And of course, here in Hebrews 11, we've highlighted they all died in faith. They were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So they didn't resort to any particular area of sacred space that the Jewish nation had been so conditioned with. 
So we know Abram was a friend of God and that closeness and that relationship was particularly important. So just opening sentences of Stephen. He's there before these great elders to answer the question about, well, the temple is important and this holy place is important as well. He's there to answer that and within a few sentences, he's highlighted their inadequacies, their ignorance concerning the promises to their forefathers and he made, he's made these two points. True worship and a relationship with God doesn't require a temple, i.e. the life of Abraham. And secondly, the law of Moses was not essential for salvation, but faith was, because Abraham existed before the formal law of Moses was constructed. So it's a brilliant start to a speech in which he's going to unravel the history and show that that was the consistent approach of faithful brethren, patriarchs who had gone before. Their emphasis was not on sacred space. So you'll notice there in verse 6 as we move on, it says there that his descendants would sojourn in a strange land and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil for 400 years. Now Stephen constantly is referring to numerics. 400 years. Now why did he add that in? Why didn't he just say, well they all you know, went down to Egypt and they were there for a while and they came back out with Moses. Why did he say 400 years in a foreign land? He says, in a strange land, some renditions say, in a foreign land. That's his point. Here's the people of Israel, and they're in a foreign land without a temple. People like Joseph and Amram and Jochebed and Aaron and Joshua were all born in Egypt, and they were faithful people. And they worshipped and served God, and here's Stephen's point, 400 years so they were still worshipping God in a foreign land, not, not for you know, five years or ten years or twenty years, four hundred years, and they worshipped God. So again, you can see all between the, the sentences that we read here is an emphasis on the relationship, the importance of the relationship with God. It doesn't matter where you are. You don't have to be connected to the temple. Not only that, in verse 7, he goes on to say... At the end of verse 7, after that they will come forth and serve me in this place. You see that little emphasis on the word this place at the end of verse 7? Well, that was the allegation, the charge against him. You'll notice at the end of verse 13 of chapter 6 that he's speaking blasphemous, blasphemous words against this holy place. See that end of verse 13 of chapter 6? And again in verse 14, we've heard him say that Jesus now shall destroy this place. See that little phrase, this place? Well, here it is in verse 7 of chapter 7. He brings it forward again. God will, they'll serve God in this place. Well, where was this place that he's referring to in verse 7? Was that Jerusalem? Was it the temple? Where was that holy place? Well, it's down the area of Sinai, Horeb, isn't it? It's not Jerusalem at all. So the children of Israel came out of Egypt and they were going to serve God in a holy place and it wasn't Jerusalem and it wasn't the temple. It was Mount Sinai. And what's interesting, Stephen brings out for the first time at the end of verse 7, he quotes the little phrase, they will serve God. You know what, that hasn't been in the Bible until it is in the place where he's quoting from Exodus 3 verse 12. So Exodus 3 verse 12 says, the people of Israel will come and serve me in this place. And Stephen quotes that because it's the first time in the Bible the phrase serve God is used and it's used in context that, well, it wasn't Jerusalem or the temple, it was Mount, Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb in that particular area. And not only that, that place in verse 7 is also referenced uh, in later on in the speech in verse 33 where God said to Moses, take your shoes off because the place where you stand is holy ground. So that's interesting, isn't it? Again, it wasn't Jerusalem. It wasn't the temple where Moses was instructed to take his shoes off, but it was the place where the sacred name of Yahweh was revealed in its fullness to Moses. Remember at the burning bush. So Stephen is laying a very, very powerful emphasis that, well, Jerusalem and the temple aren't the focus of a relationship with God. And I guess that's a lesson that needs to be, we need to be thinking about that layer as well. We can't just look at this chapter and say, well, you know, interesting speech for the Sanhedrin and for the nation of Israel, they didn't understand God. Well, do we? Uh, and this little phrase says, the place that's important to God 
is the place where he meets with his people. I don't know, have you met God this week in any way? Have you come into his presence? Or are you relying on the ritual of coming here on a Wednesday night or on a Sunday and you think, well, this is the holy place and this is what makes me righteous by my attendance here? So you need, see, what Stephen is saying to us, brothers and sisters, is our relationship to God needs to be broader than just getting into the cycle of ecclesial life. It actually needs to be bigger. We need to be drawn close to God, and that can be in any, any place. It can be at our workplace. Uh, it can be in a quiet place. It can be outside our home. I mean, how often do we actually pray outside? So this is the lesson that Stephen is, is implicating the nation for, and also us as well. So we have to be careful we don't just delude ourselves as the nation of Israel did that the cycle of worship that we have here, I mean it's good, it's important, it's essential, but it's not all that being a Christadelphian should be. It's important to serve God in the right way and it's important for us to come here and to learn things. I mean we're opening God's word and we're actually sitting down and we're hopefully learning a few extra points about God. We listen to the prayers of chairman and we might be intrigued by some phraseology that they used. I was up at Glenlock on Sunday and the chairman there made reference in his prayer. He says we want to pray for healing for those that have brain injury and special needs and of course in Glenlock there's a couple of kids that uh, have those needs and I was you know intrigued and I think educated by some phraseology there that I haven't really, that's outside of my zone, I haven't often thought about that, but for them they were focused on that. So you know, when we come here and we listen to the prayers of chairman and other brethren, that can be educational and helpful to us as well, but it's not the be all and end all of our relationship with God. Well we notice in verse 8 as well that he talks about the covenant of circumcision. And for the Jewish mind again, this was all it was. It was a definition of what being a Jew was all about. But to Stephen, of course, circumcision spoke of future promises, which they didn't understand at all. And of course, the, the Jewish people, their heritage, their culture was, uh, they isolated circumcision for all it represented, and it was backward looking for them. It, it, it connected them back to Abraham. It was a ritual that they engaged in that connected them to Abraham, and that's all it ever meant. But in reality, what it was pointing forward to was the sealing of those promises which were future. So it should have been forward-looking. And of course the, the promises to Abraham were that he would become a father of many nations. So again, it wasn't just Jewish exclu exclusiveness. So he introduced that section on Abraham to remind them that the promises were future, that Abraham hadn't received them, and of course he didn't have a temple, he didn't have a law, but he did have a close relationship with God. And now he moves on to another man who is very similar, verses 9 through to 18, Joseph. It's another individual who served God faithfully without a temple and without the law of Moses. So you'll notice in verse 9, Stephen very subtly introduces a sort of two levels into his speech now. He says, the patriarchs, verse 9, moved with envy. Wonder if that made um, a few squirm in their seats. I, I, I wonder how Nicodemus felt, uh, Joseph of Arimathea perhaps, because he's drawing a parallel between the brothers of Joseph who were envious at him and the Sanhedrin and their connection or disconnection with Jesus because they were moved with envy. That was all it was. They, they could not confound the Lord Jesus Christ in his teaching or in his miracles. And so it was just jealousy and envy that ate them out. And Stephen is, is introducing this into his, his speech. And what he's saying is history is being repeated. You've sold an innocent person because you were envious of him. And again, Mark 15 verse 10 says, Pilate knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. Actually uses that exact phraseology. Mark 15 verse 10. And so they consulted with Judas and we know they engaged in the exchange of money, 30 pieces of silver, to sell Jesus. So what Stephen is saying is, yes, this is all historical. History is repeating itself. Your forefathers sold Joseph for envy. And well, he doesn't really finish the sentence, does he? But we could. And you've done exactly the same with Jesus of Nazareth. 
But he's going to add a little bit of pressure now because the next phrase is, but God was with him. Do you notice that at the end of verse 9? There was envy between the brothers, but God was with Joseph. And again, he's highlighting a very significant phrase. See, it's all about relationship, isn't it? We're getting the picture because here it says Joseph was brought down to Egypt. Well, can you have a relationship with God in Egypt? Well, yes, because he says God was with him. And we know that this is a phrase that is significantly repeated in Genesis 39, right through God was with Joseph. So again, Stephen's not just saying things off the top of his head. He's gone back in his, his, his he memorised uh, this particular scripture and he's bringing out the main theme phrase in Genesis uh, 39 there. And of course, uh, he says that God was with him. And that's right. But look at this, this quotation here. Well, this is Nicodemus, isn't it? And I wonder what Nicodemus, whether that was, you know, he was thinking about these sorts of things as he was in the Sanhedrin. Of course, by now he's left the Sanhedrin and he's aligned himself with Christ. But back then, he says, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher come from God. No one can do these miracles except God be with him. That's the exact phraseology here in Stephen's speech. And there are some people in the Sanhedrin uh, that refused to accept that. And so Stephen's saying, history is repeated, repeating itself. Peter used the same phrase in Acts 10 verse 38. In a speech he says, God has anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy Spirit with power, who went about doing good and healing all those that were oppressed of sicknesses, for God was with him. So there's a clear analogy that God was with, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, undoubtedly, and with Joseph. The question is, where was God with Joseph? Was he manifested in a temple or a law or some sort of holy place? No. In Egypt. So let's think about Egypt. To an Israelite mind, what would Egypt represent? To the Jewish mind, what would Egypt represent? Good place or bad place? Well, the people of Israel nationally would remember their history that it was a place of harshness, a place where the pharaohs beat them. And, of course, the whole story of the Exodus unraveled. But, you see, here's Stephen's point. God can be worshipped faithfully in a place like Egypt. Was Egypt considered sacred space? Not at all. But God was with Joseph and exalted him and made him and placed him in a position of authority. So Stephen's used Mesopotamia, Haran. He's now moving down to Egypt. You can see what he's painting, this amazing picture of people that are close to God, but they weren't even in the land of Israel at all for much of the connection that they had to, to the Father, those promises that they responded to. And, of course, uh, colouring an exercise is this word Egypt. It's a major theme here in Acts chapter 7 because Paul, uh, sorry, Paul, Stephen is highlighting uh, this area historically that faithful people operated even in Egypt and drew a close relationship with God. And that's, I guess, encouraging for us. We don't have a strong connection to a sacred place, to a temple. We're part of spiritual Egypt, we might say, but we need to develop, as Joseph did, a relationship with God. And, of course, verse 10 goes on to say, he rescued him from all his afflictions. He rescued him. He delivered him out of all his afflictions. And, of course, the parallel is continuing to be painted that of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and elevated to the right hand of the Father, just as Joseph was elevated in Egypt. So, again, there's that phraseology coming through. And verse 11, he goes on to talk about a dearth coming through the land. And again, tribulation waited for the nation. AD 70 was just around the corner and certainly they were going to feel the effects of that scourge from the Roman army as they invaded and decimated the nation. So certainly famine and tribulation awaited the nation in the day of Stephen. But he introduces again another key word in the next section. In verse 11, he says, there was great affliction and our fathers found no sustenance. So he's now introducing uh, another key word and it's the key word, our fathers. So Stephen 
didn't disconnect himself from history. He didn't say, well, you know, you Jewish people. He recognised, like Daniel did, that he's part of that, that nation and that heritage. So he uses this phrase, our fathers, consistently. But, of course, he disconnects toward the end of his speech and he talks about your fathers. So you'll see here, he talks about our fathers from verse 11 through to 45, and then there's a distinctive shift because there's a different pathway taken. He says, you do resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? So there was a divergent pathway. And of course, we know that same discussion was held by the Lord Jesus Christ. People of Israel claim, oh, God's our father. You know, uh, there's sort of an implication to Jesus. Well, who's your father? We know wh what happened in your background. God's our father and Christ pointed out, you are of your father, Diablos, and the lust of your father. He was a murderer and he was a liar. So Stephen really is painting the same pathway. There were fathers that they connected to, but of course the Sanhedrin was leading the nation astray from God. We notice there in verse 12, again, numerics. There's an interesting little point in verse 12. He says, when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first, verse 13, and at the second time. I wonder what point Stephen's trying to make here. First time, second time. Why would he place that emphasis there? Well, there's a couple of points. First of all, there's no food in Israel. So salvation was divinely and providentially arranged by God in Egypt. That would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? So there's the promised land, but actually salvation and redemption was found in Egypt. And for Jacob, he was instructed to go down into Egypt. For Jacob, that would have been rather traumatic because his father Isaac went to Egypt and that was a bad move. God told him off for that. And so Jacob's going to Egypt and he thinks, is this the pathway I should take? Well, God revealed himself at Beersheba, right on the borders of the Promised Land, before you enter into Egypt, and he said, no, this is the correct thing to do. Go down into Egypt and I'll bless you there. So why does Stephen comment the second time in verse 13? Well, because we know the brothers didn't recognise Joseph the first time, did they? But when they came down the second time, they recognised him. So see this beautiful and, and delicate technique that Stephen is using? People in the Sanhedrin who are thinking would recognise the parallels that he's drawing with Jesus Christ. The nation rejected Jesus Christ the first time, but the second time they will embrace him and accept him. That's what the implication is uh, for Stephen, that he's applying to the, the people of Israel. And in fact, here's some phraseology that he's built into his speech that's drawing a parallel between Joseph and the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't do it bluntly or blatantly, he threads it in between so thinking people would be moved, hopefully moved by his talk. So, of course, we've already talked about moved with envy. And, of course, Mark 15.10, chief priests were moved with envy. They sold him. Well, here's Judas, of course, engaged in an in a exchange of money. But God was with him. Well, we've talked about Acts 10, verse 38. Delivered him. Acts 2.24, delivered by the determinate character. Gave him favour and wisdom. Of course, well, Jesus was known for his wisdom and his gracious words. Uh, made him governor, said Stephen. Peter points out in Acts 2, he's on the right hand of God, exalted. There was a dearth, no sustenance. Jesus proclaimed he was the bread of life and people who were not finding sustenance would have their hunger uh, satiated. Sent out our fathers first. Well, John 1 says we didn't know him. His own received him not. And the second time he is known to his brethren, while well, prophecy of Zechariah says, they shall look upon me whom they pierce. So, very wonderfully, very delicately, very subtly, Stephen in his speech is not aggravating the Sanhedrin, but he's bringing that lesson in to make them think about the parallels between Joseph and the Lord Jesus Christ. So verse 14, he adds another little point. Uh, he says there, then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred, well here comes numerics again, three score and fifteen souls. Now, you know, why is Stephen mentioning seventy-five souls? 
again, comment in and say, you know what, Stephen got the number wrong. He's obviously a little bit nervous and he didn't do the, the math properly. Well, did he get it wrong? Because he says here that 75 people came down uh, into Egypt, right? Well, when we look at these references, Genesis 46 says, well, 70. Exodus 1 verse 5 says 70. And Deuteronomy 10 verse 22 says, fathers went down to Egypt with 70 people. Oh, this is a bit embarrassing. Did Stephen get it wrong? Well, get out our blackboard again because we're going to do some algebra. No, not algebra. There was never any good algebra. We're going to do some maths, though, to prove that Stephen was right. Moses states all the souls that came to it with Jacob in Egypt, which issued from his loins, key point, so not his son's wives, were 66 souls. And here's the number calculated. So we can go through uh, Jacob's family. There's all his sons and his grandsons, and you can add them all up, and it adds to... 66. So if to these 66 children, grandchildren, and great grandchildren, we add Jacob to himself, Joseph and his two sons, the amount is 70. So there are 70, of course, that are connected to Jacob that are in Egypt. But of course, we haven't added in the wives of Jacob's sons who form part of the household. There's nine there. So, of course, when we take the 66 and add the wives to them, well, we get to 75. Okay, so that's what Stephen is saying. He's saying all his kindred, all the people connected, were 75, whereas this reference says which issued from his loins. So there's, there's a sort of a difference there. We have to add in, of course, the wives that became part of the family in Egypt. So, you see, Stephen, again, is correct with his calculation. Why the preciseness with this number 75? Because he's emphasising that all the family left, all of them, 75 of them, they were all down in, in Egypt. There was no one left in Israel at all. And really, I think he's bringing out this particular point here. This is what he's saying. If you're doing the right thing, you're in the right place, and that means you're close to God. Okay, so God instructed the family to go down to Egypt. They did that, and they were faithful in that. The exhortation to all of us is that if we're doing the right things, we are in the right place. We mightn't be inside a temple. We mightn't be surrounded by some sort of sacred place. But we can be close to God, and that's the important thing that Stephen is emphasising. So... This relocation of 75, says Stephen, set the stage for God's redemptive grace. And that wasn't seen in the land of Canaan. I mean, God could have solved the fat famine, right? He didn't have to shift the whole of the nation down to Egypt. He could have solved the famine then and there. But in the way that God worked through, he allowed the people of Israel to go down to Egypt to teach important lessons. And he didn't abandon Jacob and his family simply because they left the promised land. They grew and developed. Well, verse 16, well, here's another error, say the critics. It says there in verse 16, and they were carried over to Shechem and laid in a sepulchre that Abram bought for a vast sum of money of the sons of Hamor, the, the father of Shechem. So we read verse 15, Jacob went down to Egypt and he died. <coughs> He and our fathers and were carried over to Shechem. Now, you could read that, that, well, oh, Jacob died there and he's brought back up and he was buried in Shechem. You could read it that way, right? Which some people have, have done. And they said, well, Stephen's got it wrong because we know that Jacob wasn't buried in Shechem. He was buried in Hebron. So, you know, that's pretty obvious that he's got that wrong. Well, did Stephen get it wrong? Well, here in Genesis 33, it says Jacob came to Shechem here and he brought, and the other, the other fact they're saying is wrong, is that it says there that Abram brought uh, this area in Shechem. All right, see that in verse 16? Laid in the sepulchre that Abraham brought. There's no record of that. There's no record back in the Old Testament of Abraham buying an area land in Shechem. So Stephen's introducing a new point, but historically, of course, the Sanhedrin knew that he was correct. 
Because back in Genesis 33, it says Jacob came to, to, to Shalem, a city of Shechem, and he bought the Hebrew means to redeem or to recover. Okay, so he didn't, it's not a new buying of a plot of land. He's actually redeeming something that had been previously bought, i.e. by Abraham. A parcel of field where he spread his tent, the hand of Hamor, Shechem's father, a hundred pieces of silver, and he put an altar there and he called it Ael, a lower Israel, which is interesting because when historically they thought about this, and again, their whole point is this temple, uh, this sacred space is important to us. Stephen's pointing out, well, you know what? Jacob, he redeemed an area of land in Shechem and the patriarchs, the 12 sons, were actually carried up there, not, not Jacob, his sons were buried there in Shechem. So here we have the proof in Joshua 24. The bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel bought out of Egypt, he buried in Shechem, in a parcel of ground which Jacob bought, and it's the same word, redeemed. All right. So Abram originally bought it, Jacob redeemed it, and the patriarchs, the 12 fathers of the tribes, were buried in Shechem. Well, that's pretty embarrassing, isn't it? Because Shechem, if you think of New Testament times, in the time of Jesus, Samaria, Shechem, uh, that was a hated, the Samaritans were a hated race of people because they disturbed the, the truth. They were a mixture of religion. And so here, Brother Carter, in a book says, might have been argued that the transfer of Jacob's bones to the church of Judea showed the land had special sanctity. He's saying, well, look, we brought the bones up of Jacob back to the promised land. See, it is holy space. But by citing the burial place in Shechem, he reminds them if there be sanctity attached to a place, it wasn't limited to Judea, but included the land of the hated Samaritans. So Stephen is pointing out that the forefathers of the tribes are buried up the road in Shechem, which was a place that they, they hated. So Stephen's making this constant point, you're overrating, you are overrating the temple. And the Jews themselves were tied to the temple. And Stephen is emphasising that God is not limited. We can't put God in a box. We can't just put him in one little place. <laughs> you know, as kids, we, we learn, where is God? He's everywhere present by his spirit, which fills heaven and earth. And that's true. This is really what Stephen is saying. And so he's used examples from Mesopotamia. He's used examples from Egypt. And now he's using an example from Samaria. So quite incredibly... Uh, into we, interwoven into his speech is these aspects that God can be anywhere and can be lived close and comfortably with a person who has a right and a spiritual mind. So he places this emphasis on Samaria, which I think is particularly interesting because if you turn the page and you come to chapter 8 and verse 5, after the speech of Stephen, this is the first, uh, this is the first reaction to Stephen, and there's two reactions, one in verse 1, Saul was consenting to his death and there was persecution. But you look at what Philip, and there's an interesting connection. Remember Philip was one of the seven with Stephen who assisted the widows and distributed and helped and supported. So they obviously had quite a close relationship, Stephen and Philip together. So Stephen was put to death, but he made reference to Shechem. And Saul now beats the ecclesia and the response of Philip, who was... Best buddies with Stephen, verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. That's Shechem, that's, that's the hated area. So Philip totally understood what Stephen was getting at, that God can be accepted and worshipped anywhere, even in the hated and despised territory of Samaria. And we know that Jesus made exactly the same point, didn't he? In John chapter 4. Remember his conversation in Samaria with a woman by the well? And she said, look, we want to work out which is the important sacred place. You know, you've got a temple down in Jerusalem and you say that it's Jerusalem where God is worshipped. We say, you know, Mount Gerizim, who's right? Who, who has the right place? And Jesus said, no, it's not the place. It's the heart and the mind of the person. So, of course, here it is. Does true worship require a temple? Here's the woman, our fathers, interesting that she used that term because the Samaritans traced their ascendancy back through to Jacob. They believed that they were 
were, were part of that. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, but you say Jerusalem is the place. Christ says, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem worship the Father. He's saying it doesn't matter. The hour cometh and now is when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, and the Father seeks such to worship him. And I thought that's, that's amazing and a wonderful connection that is made uh, between Stephen here as he's talked about the history of Israel and he's emphasised to them that it's not the place, it's the mind, it's the spirit, it's the attitude that God can dwell with. And of course that's the important things to us. We need to remember that we're not made holy because we come into this particular place. It's important that we do, we explore the Bible, we have fellowship, we sing praise, we engage in prayer. All of that is important and it's essential but it's not the only thing. It's more essential to allow God to inhabit our minds. And the Apostle Paul picked up that point in the New Testament. First of Corinthians 3.16, he says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you? Well, that's a big question for all of us, isn't it? Is your mind a place where God is comfortable? Is your mind a place where God can actually dwell? Or are there so many, is, is there darkness, is there distractions? Or am I filled with other things that God would be uncomfortable? That's the thrust, really, of Stephen's speech. So what are the lessons that we've learned? Stephen gets the minute details. We talked about numerics, and he's got that embedded here in his, his talk. He gets them correct. How concerned are you to grow your knowledge in the details of God's word? Sometimes we're, we're happy with just a blur, aren't we? And how many times we've done the readings and we you know, suddenly stagger on a point, we think, I've read that for 40 years, I've never seen it. It's, we're a bit annoyed with ourselves, probably. So sometimes we just get comfortable with just, well, yeah, it's all very interesting, but we don't really drill down and, and grasp hold of the minute details. Stephen felt that was important. And so should we. And that's why it's a benefit for us to be here, brothers and sisters, as we admire the intricacies of Stephen's speech. We learn about that. His point was God was with Joseph even in Egypt. Question to ask, are there dark areas in your life where you question God's providence? Uh, and again, it's, it's the same sort of thing. Stephen's point is, we can be in a place where we feel a little bit embarrassed or uncomfortable or should we be here or should we not be here, but if we have the mind of Joseph, of course we can construct that relationship and be brought closer to our God. And God can work providentially in our lives, even though sometimes we might find ourselves in places that we shouldn't be. God, if we're faithful and if we trust him, he can bring us and bless us and elevate us as he did Joseph. Thirdly, Jacob's family, 75, noted, moved to Egypt and the truth survived for 400, it's another point, mathematical point he makes, chronology, 400 years. Would your example and your legacy influence your descendants, your family, your friends, to love God for the next 400 years? That's, you know, it's not just all about us. Sometimes we just think, oh, if I knew I could make the kingdom, I'm trying hard. Well, it's not just about us, it's about how we influence others. It's how, as a community, as an ecclesia, we strengthen our defences so that we have a legacy that continues to, to love the truth. And finally, while involvement in ecclesial events is important, do you limit yourself to intermittent attendance and think that's all God requires? Stephen's point is, brothers and sisters, God requires more than temple worship because... As Paul says, you are God's temple and God's spirit should dwell in you.